you guys hear the, can you hear the kids or is that just me? You can hear them. Hey, do not be distracted or dismayed by that sound. Uh, that is the sound of the future. That is the sound of a next generation being excited to be at church, being excited about uh, Jesus. And so when you hear that, don't, don't be in the back like, ah, they're distracting. I promise you what's happening up there is so much more important than what's happening in this room, okay? So be encouraged when you hear those, ki those kids uh, shouting for Jesus. That's a beautiful thing. Okay, uh, here we go. Good stuff in, good stuff out. Bad stuff in, bad stuff out. Okay, such a simple concept, right? Such a basic and uncomplicated and straightforward concept, yet so very rarely actually adopted uh, and, and employed. Uh, the Apostle Paul, he talks about this very idea in the final chapter of the book of Philippians, chapter 4, that we're going to wrap up with today. So uh, today we're going to put a bow on this Joyful Expectation series, uh, but before we do that, uh, let's pray. Would you pray with me? Holy Spirit, we just, um, first, thank you for that sound. Thank you for those kids that are uh, up there. Thank you for the families that you are bringing here, who are centering their homes on you. Lord, we just, we pray good things for those, those children. Would you reveal yourself to those kids um, in these moments where they're up there learning about your word, but also in, in the homes where moms and dads are discipling their own kids. Uh, we thank you for this day. We thank you for a new day of life, of breath. Every day is a gift from you, so we rejoice in that. We know that there are, um, in this same moment, there are other Christ-honoring churches meeting right now, opening your word, worshiping you. And so we want to lift up our brothers and our sisters at, uh, at one church in particular, Foothills Bible Church, as they meet in this same moment. We, just, we ask that as they open the scripture, you would reveal new things to them. We ask that you would help them be fruitful in their their efforts to reach this community. We, of course, we pray the same thing for ourselves. Would you be in this, uh, this moment as we read your scripture and we talk about it, prepare our hearts to engage with your word. I very humbly pray and ask that you would allow my words to be um, of value, allow them to be true. And of course, we thank you for uh, your work on the cross. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so if you've been with us for the last three weeks or so, you know that uh, we have been making our way through the book of Philippians. There's four chapters in that book, so one chapter a week for a four-week series works out perfect, right? And uh, if you... Uh, go back and watch this, or if you were with us, uh, you'll know that last week we, we discussed chapter 3. Ben, ben shared this idea that full transformation for the Christian, it is only possible when we fully reorient our lives on Jesus. Um, the other way of saying that is when we fully center our lives on Jesus. Ben talked about uh, the grace of God. He talked about how there is nothing we can do to move this needle of God's love. We can't make him love us more. We can't make him love us less. God's love is simply, it is what it is. Which brings us to chapter 4, um, which actually uh, should be preached in two sermons. And the reason for that is because we see kind of a, an abrupt change in thought and command from Paul. Uh, we see these two sections that are kind of unrelated to one another, as I see it. Uh, but since we do not have another week, uh, we will have to cover it all today. So, uh, you, my friends, are getting a two-for-one special on your sermons this morning. So, uh, I appreciate the courtesy laugh, but I know there was kind of a, uh, a collective sigh there. But really, uh, if, I'm, if I'm known for anything, it is, I think it's my brevity. So, I think we can pull this off, okay? So, we're going to break uh, today into two parts. Verses 1 through 9, and then we'll talk about that, mini-sermon number 1. And then verses... Uh, 10 through 20, and that will be mini sermon number two. So if you have your Bible, um, you can follow along. There is, uh, there is so much content that we're going to cover today. So I created some sermon resource notes. Those are out in the lobby. I encourage you to grab those. All the takeaways that we're going to be talking about today are found on those notes. So really, 
You could take a nap right now and then just grab these notes on the way out and you would be okay. I'm kidding. That would hurt my feelings. Okay, so here we go. Starting in verse one. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stay true to the Lord. I love you and I long to see you, dear friends, for you are my joy and the crown I receive for my work. Now I appeal to you, Odia and Syntyche, please, because you belong to the Lord, settle your disagreement. And I ask you, my true partner, to help these two women, for they worked hard with me in telling the good news. They worked along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are written in the book of life. Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. Don't worry about anything, but instead pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything that we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all that you have learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. Uh, Paul, uh, as he often did, would end his letters with the brass tacks, um, the practical things that uh, you can or you should be doing as a, either as an individual or as a, a church. And this, this is no different. Uh, Paul gives us some real-world, uh, hands-on, practical ways to express our affection for our Savior while holding on to this eternal mindset, but an eternal mindset that is still informing obedience now and in the present. And so there are really five worthwhile takeaways, as I see it, from, from these first nine verses. Five encouragements that Paul is giving to the individual or to the church as a whole. And so we're going to fly through those, and uh, they'll be on your screen. So takeaway number one, be of the same mind. Verse two says, please, because you belong to the Lord, settle your disagreement. Now, we don't know exactly what that disagreement was between Euodia and Syntyche, but what we do know is that these two women, they did play an important role in the spreading of the gospel in that area. We know that they were both devoted followers of Jesus. We know that Paul personally cared for these two women because Paul would never rebuke people by name in any of his letters unless he had a personal relationship with them. And the last thing that we know about uh, these two women's, uh, these two women, is their disagreement. It was a big enough deal that it made its way back to Paul uh, in some form or another. It was probably Ephroditus uh, who mentioned it to him when he visited Paul in, in jail. Now, while we cannot know for sure the tone or the context of this disagreement, it, it, it could have been casual. It could have been a casual mention from Aphrodite to Paul, but it could have been something bigger. We just, we just don't know. Either way, uh, there was clearly some level of division that was growing in this church, this really special church. And Paul, being super experienced when it came to church leadership and church health, he implores them and he implores us to not uh, allow disunity to breed and to take root. Friends, disunity is a spark that when it catches, it burns churches to the ground. This happens all the time. Paul implores them and us to put in the hard work of unity. Unity does not happen by accident. Uh, no, in fact, the default is almost always disunity when it comes to matters of the church. And so Paul is, is simply saying, put all of that aside for the sake of the gospel, because the, the work of the church is so much more important, and disunity gets in the way of that work, and it gets in the way of joy too. So the takeaway worth noting here is this. It is very possible to love Jesus and work hard for his cause and still have a broken relationship with someone who loves Jesus and works hard for his cause. But there is just, there simply is no defense for staying unreconciled with another believer. We are called to make every effort to live at peace with everyone. Uh, my really smart buddy, 
uh, Scott Pollock once said this on Church Unity, and he actually said it for the very first time from this very stage. So let me read you this quote from Scott. What is biblical unity? It is not uniformity, which is to act the same. It is not unanimity, which is to think the same. It is not identicality, which is to look the same. No. True unity is diversity within a cohesive and binding identity. Unity is a living thing that must be constantly tended, nourished, and contended for. Okay, moving on. Second takeaway. Here we go. Rejoice in the Lord. Verse 4 says, always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. I can just tell you I'm not um, quite mature enough just yet uh, to have this attitude that Paul has. If I were thrown into prison for something that I I, I didn't do, I'd be a little more fussy about it, but uh, Paul's outlook, it can teach us a very key lesson. And we touched on this during week one, if you remember. Our attitude is a choice, and our attitude should not be connected to or correlate with whatever the circumstances are that we might find ourselves in, be it good or bad. Paul's joy, it was unwavering because he got to this place where his heart abided so very closely with Jesus that his circumstances, unpleasant or not, they just didn't play a part in his uh, contentment or his attitude or his joy. And I I get it, it's so easy to slip into discouragement when those unfavorable circumstances come our way. They come almost daily. But I wonder, I wonder this, if sometimes we might be taking those disagreeable things that happen to all of us, we might be taking those things just a little bit too seriously. See, I was at a dinner uh, a couple of weeks ago with eight or nine of you, actually, and it just happened to be my birthday that night. That's not why we were meeting. Um, and apparently Facebook is broadcasting all my personal information, so everybody knew it was my birthday. And um, So we were at this dinner, and someone mentions that, and so I asked a question that I, I've been asking for years, whenever it's my birthday or somebody else's birthday. I, I love to ask this question. I ask them, um, assuming they're, they're older than me, what do you know now at uh, 60 or whatever it is that you wish you knew when you were my age, which is uh, mid to late 30s? And so, uh, and the answer that I get it is always the same. I asked this of, of, of a woman there, and she said what everyone says. Without fail, so far, every time I've asked that question, I get some version of this answer. I wish I knew how to n- not sweat the small stuff. Isn't that an interesting consistency in answer? The wisdom that these people have gained over all these years, it is found in the uncomplicatedness of verse 4 that we see right here. So if you often find yourself getting upset or frustrated or unsatisfied or annoyed about things, perhaps, just perhaps your lens is a little dirty or a little out of focus. Uh, This happens to me whenever I get out of alignment with the Holy Spirit. And here is the secret to getting back into alignment, getting back to this uh, expected expectant joy mindset. The secret is this, gratitude. It's simply gratitude to dwell on the things that, that we can and should be thankful for and then weigh that with how unworthy each of us are of any good things outside of our positional righteousness with Christ. And then when you do that and genuine gratitude starts flowing back into your life, I promise you, I promise you, joy is always close behind. Paul figured that out. He figured out that secret and he's given it to us here. Okay, we gotta move on. Third takeaway. Be gentle. Verse five says, let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. Uh, Some translations use the phrase, uh, let your gentleness be evident to all. The framework The framework for this caring and this gentle behavior, it is built upon this pending return of Jesus. That's referenced here, and then it's referenced uh, earlier in chapter 3, verse 20. Uh, This joyful expectation that we are supposed to subscribe to is found in the return of Jesus. Because the return of Jesus to collect his church, to collect us, 
it is always looming. And it was this mindset that allowed Paul to remain undiscouraged in his plight. His mind was so focused on being with Jesus that he was able to see through the other stuff. And when your mind is focused on those kinds of things, gentleness towards others, that just becomes an easy byproduct. It just becomes easier to deploy. Being considerate and gentle towards both those inside and outside of the church, at least for me, it means this. It means not being excessively vocal or overly advocating for what I think I'm doing. For me, it means overlooking an offense when I think I have been unfairly treated. For me, it means doing my very best to be respectful and rational and objective and charitable when interacting with others, especially the difficult others. And for, and for those non-Christians in our life, the call to gentleness is the exact same. The world may very well be unreceptive, unsympathetic, sometimes flat out just hostile towards the values of Jesus and his church. And that's actually okay. It's okay because we should not expect unbelievers to act like believers. That's an unreasonable thing to want and expect. And while we are absolutely, hear me, hear me clearly, while we are absolutely called to oppose and reject the lies of our broken and tormented world, we are not called to be harsh or cruel about it. There is no excuse for the Christian that lacks gentleness. There just isn't. And I've heard this argument before. To proclaim that gentleness just isn't a part of your personality or your demeanor, that is an indefensible position to hold as a Christian. Christians are called to abide in Christ and in doing so take on the characteristics of the Holy Spirit. And it just so happens that one of those characteristics that Paul lists in the book of Galatians happens to be gentleness. And so if some or all of your personal relationships cannot be described or defined using the word gentle, uh, you're probably in the wrong, and that's probably a relationship that needs some of your attention. Okay, moving on. Fourth takeaway. Be anxious for nothing. Verses 6 and 7 say this, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then, as in after you do that first part, then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Uh, many translations start that verse off with the phrase, be anxious for nothing, instead of the word worry. And so I am now going to attempt to put into practice what we just talked about regarding gentleness, because this next takeaway, it can be a very uh, delicate subject in today's world in today's culture, and even in the church. A culture and a world that is absolutely plagued by clinically diagnosed anxiety disorders that are causing real pain to real people. I would bet that 95% of us in this room probably know somebody personally who is afflicted with some sort of clinical diagnosed anxiety or depression. In fact, I heard this study this recent study that says today's average high school student has the same levels of anxiety, however that's measured, as the average psychiatric hospital patient, patient of the 1950s. So let that one sink in just for a second. And so assuming that is true, uh, our world, it needs an answer for anxiety. And so to be clear, I am not saying, hear me, Hear me clearly, this is on tape. I am not saying that medication is a bad thing. And I am not saying that the scripture gives the perfect prescription for resolving clinically diagnosed anxiety or depression issues. But what I am actually saying is the scripture at least gives us a really, really solid starting point that should be considered and should be leveraged. And I love the way my very, very sweet my very, very gentle and kind and gracious wife put it uh, when talking about this delicate topic of medication. She said this. I wrote it down so good. I should have put it on the screen, but I didn't. Medication can be a fantastic tool for battling anxiety. But as a Christian, 
it cannot be the only tool you are using to fix that problem. So to be clear, listen to me carefully, please. I'm not saying you should carry any level of shame if you require medication to treat some kind of anxiety or depression issue. I'm not saying that. I am saying it can't be the only thing that you're trying to deploy against that battle. No amount of medication is going to resolve the anxiety and the depression issues and crisis that are plaguing some of us on a daily basis. But like I said, the scripture actually gives us a fantastic starting point. So let's talk about that. According to the holy and the living and the spirit-filled scripture, step one is prayer. Are you actually, genuinely praying about everything? That is step one. Bring it before the Holy Spirit daily, hourly, moment by moment if needed. Now, I personally can't imagine just yet what it's like to not worry about anything. But what Paul's advice here is, it's to turn those worries into prayers. This is something I have personally been working very hard on myself uh, for at least the last eight to 12 months. When worries pop into my head, I've been trying to train myself to, to have my natural, just reflexive reaction to be prayer, to turn those worries into prayers. So step one is prayer. Step two is also prayer. Pray until the peace that's talked about in verse seven actually begins to emerge. The peace that does not make sense given your circumstances. The peace that can actually guard your heart and can guard your mind as you abide in Christ. Now here's the thing about peace. Peace is not looking at the world around you and deceiving yourself by saying, all is well with the world. Because I am here to tell you all is verifiably, certifiably, not well in our world. Our world has lost all sense of truth and direction. No, peace is bringing your gaze above all that you see around you and saying, it is well with my Savior and therefore it can be well with my soul and I can have peace in that reality. So friends, if you are looking to anything in this world, even the, the few good and pure things that still exist in this world, if you are looking to anything other than Jesus for peace, for anxiety, if you're looking to anything, you are looking to something secondary, something that is less optimal. Uh, there's so much we could talk about there, but we need to move on. So our fifth and final takeaway of mini sermon number one. Remember, there's another one coming. So fifth takeaway, good things in, good things out, bad things in, bad things out. Verse eight says this, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. The, the four takeaways that come before this are all predicated on this one, this fifth and final takeaway, meaning unless you adopt this fifth takeaway, you cannot and you should not expect to be able to execute the first four. Good things in, good things out. Bad things in, bad things out. It's basic. It's almost too basic. I'll give you that. But it is foundationally, unequivocally true for the Christian. Good things in, good things out. Bad things in, bad things out. That is and always has been true. Even for the saved person who is positionally righteous with Christ. And while this model is absolutely proven to work, its value is so easily and so often reduced or ignored. And it's often dismissed by Christians because it is portrayed to be a legalistic approach to Christian living. But as Ben mentioned last Sunday, legalism devours joy. But this particular self-discipline actually leads to joy. So to call it legalism, that would be unfair and incorrect. And for those of you who know me, I'm one of the biggest proponents of enjoying our freedom that we have in Christ through his unmerited grace that he just bestows upon us. <clears throat> 
But this concept does not come even close to violating that freedom. In fact, it is an enhancement to that freedom. Let me explain. It is a lie that we often believe that our freedom in Christ somehow protects us from the natural and the obvious consequences of ingesting unhealthy content. And so this idea that a spiritually healthy Christian can input garbage into their eyes and into their ears and then still output healthy things, that is an absurd notion. Don't believe that lie. And do not mistake that for legalism either. No, that is wisdom. That is prudence. That is logical. For example, you cannot watch movies or TV that have nudity in them and not have that stir something up inside you. Challenge me on that, men. Nudity in, lustful thinking out. Challenge me on that. You cannot spend endless hours on Facebook or news media apps and then take in all of that mind-bending, enraging stuff that is happening in our world right now and not let that affect your joy level. You just can't. I'm not saying you, uh, you stick your head in the sand, but I'm also saying take, take stock of your spirit and your heart and your blood pressure. When you look at those current events and those news media apps, are you getting worked up? Does your getting bent out of shape resolve any of it? No. Then why bring the bad stuff in all the time? Bad things in, bad things out. Bad things in, maybe anxiety out, at least for me. If you ever hope to have the kind of peace that we talked about in Takeaway 4, the kind of prayer life that leads to that kind of peace, it absolutely requires an input of morally virtuous content. Good things in, good things out. That is always true. To believe that the spiritual life and the anxiety levels of the Christian are not significantly impacted through the content that we bring in through our eyes and our ears, to believe that is to believe a lie. Don't believe the lie. I discovered this great quote pertaining to this very thing from the legendary Dallas Willard from DTS. He said this, the ultimate freedom we have as human beings is the power to select what we will allow our minds to dwell upon. It is in our thoughts that the first movements towards the renovation of the heart occur. The scripture tells us to fix our thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. It tells us to, to think about things that are excellent and things that are worthy of praise. When we do that, when the scales begin to tip to more good stuff in than bad stuff, peace can begin to emerge Peace can become possible for the anxious heart. Okay, take a breath. I told you I had two sermons for you. I know you're looking forward to number two. But I actually think, I think we can be a lot quicker about number two. So, verses 10 through 20. Buckle up. Here we go. How I praise the Lord that you are concerned about me again. I know you have always been concerned for me, but you didn't have the chance to help me. Not that I was ever in need for uh, help, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Even so, you have done well to share with me in my present difficulty. As you know, you Philipp, uh, Philippians were the only ones who gave me financial help when I brought you the good news and then traveled on to Macedonia. No other church did this. Even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent help to me more than once. I don't say this because I want to get from you. Rather, I want you to receive a reward for your kindness. At the moment, I have all I need and more. I am generously supplied with the gifts that you sent me with Aphrodite. They are a sweet-smelling sacrifice that is acceptable and pleasing to God. And this same God who takes care of me will supply all of your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Now all glory to God our Father forever and ever. Amen. So I have just uh, three takeaways for us uh, for mini sermon number two. Takeaway number one, contentment is the secret to so many things 
especially joy and peace. We see this in verse 11. I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. Friends, Paul learned, a key word there, learned, how to be content regardless of his circumstances or what he had. He had periods of his life with great wealth, great luxury, and he had periods of his life that were uh, rooted in total poverty. If you have great needs, I want to encourage you to bring those before the Lord and see what he does with them. And if you have great wants, I want to encourage you to do the same. Present them before the Lord. Ask him to remove the things that are not of him and then see what he provides, be it abundance or the basics. Okay, I told you sermon two would be fast. So takeaway number two. I think God may want Mosaic to do some things that no other church is doing. Verse 15 says, no other church did this. Now the cynical and sometimes sinful side of my heart might say something like, churches are a dime a dozen. They are constantly being planted and they are constantly failing. But please hear me, that is not the sentiment of my heart right now. That is not what I am saying in this statement, not at all. This is not a jab at any other church or any other group of Christ followers, not even a little. This is just a continual thought in my mind and in my prayers that God has mosaic specifically here for this specific moment, just the way he has some other church bodies in their, in their locations, in their moments. And I'm, I'm telling you, I believe God is washing this place washing it. And I don't necessarily uh, mean uh, in, in the sense of he's washing away sin, but that of course too. I mean, I think he is washing away some of the gunk that has just hit our windshield over the last couple of years. And he is clarifying our direction for us. And I have, I've actually been thinking this for a while. And then the other day we had a, our 10 a.m. prayer time, which we have every, every morning. Uh, with our staff, and we were praying, and our comms director, Michelle, she prayed something. She asked the Holy Spirit to cleanse and to clarify. And then after we were done praying, I, I went to Michelle, and I said, Michelle, what did you mean by that? And she actually really didn't have an answer for me. She said, I, I don't know. I, I just felt like the Spirit was leading me to pray that. So this phrase, to cleanse and to clarify, that's what I mean when I say God is washing our windshield. It's not about any person or, or, or any sin issue it's, or anything like that. I think it's about finding a new grip on our direction as a church. And I couldn't really put words to it until that morning. And so even in the midst of some financial tension as an organization, God is doing a work here, a work of clarifying our direction and cleansing our windshield, cleansing the lens that we're looking through. And I believe he has more to come for us. Which leads us to our third and our final takeaway for sermon number two. Here it is. God will provide what he provides. Verse 19 says, And this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. I've shared this with some of you, but almost, almost every morning for almost the last four years, I've started my morning on the floor of my bedroom closet, on my knees, praying all kinds of things. But one thing that almost always gets uttered in some form or another is, God, would you please release Mosaic from its debt? And, and he hasn't done that yet. And I don't know why, but I think maybe it is because there is something we still need to learn as a church body that we just haven't learned yet, that we couldn't perhaps learn without the, the weight of this, of this burden. But perhaps, just maybe, once that lesson is learned, maybe the prayer will get answered. I don't know. I don't presume to know what God's will is here. But I have wondered if there just might be something we need to discover as a church body before he opens those floodgates to his, his glorious riches, as the, as the scriptures puts it, right? 
So would you just, would you consider joining me in that daily prayer? I know that's a ridiculous thing to pray. I get it. But would you just consider that? And maybe, maybe God will get sick of hearing it from all of us. And then who knows, Elon Musk comes along, writes us a check, gives us each a bonus Tesla or something. I don't know. I'm just saying, would you, would you pray that? But seriously, our needs are being met. And just like Paul, we will model contentment with both a lot and a little. If God provides more, we will do more as a church. And if God provides less, we will do less as a church. But whatever he does provide, whatever we do possess, make no mistake that it is directly from the hand of God. And now that we have received our double dose of sermon for the day, let me pray for us. And then we are going to celebrate with some baptisms. Would you pray with me? Uh, Holy Spirit, we just, um, we thank you for your word. We thank you for all the, the beautiful things that can be pulled from it. Would you give us wisdom to see the value or the lack of value in the things that we are taking in? Would you help us employ great wisdom that guards our hearts and guards our minds? Would you wash Would you cleanse and clarify the things we are chasing as individuals and the things we are chasing as a church? And would you provide for us and keep providing for us along the way? Help us find great joy and great contentment in whatever it is that you do choose to provide for us. We thank you so much for our Savior. And we pray in his name. Amen.